Welcome to the first in our six-part series of talks that accompany the Bible study, Keeping in Balance. I hope you've got your study guide in hand because there's an outline that'll help you follow along and take notes if you'd like. There are a couple of components to this Bible study. The lessons you do on your own, a small group discussion if you're experiencing keeping in balance in a group setting, and videos. You'll have three to four Bible study lessons in between the videos, and they are a critical part of the whole experience. The goal of Keeping in Balance is to help us discover some principles and guidelines that will help to make our lives work better. It's hard to manage life's pace and pressure when what we really long for is inner peace. We're sending out on a journey together that will help us manage expectations, set healthy boundaries, make God our highest priority, and give time to what matters most. If you are experiencing walking with purpose in a group setting, then I would guess that many emotions likely fill the room. Maybe this is the first time you've ever been to a Bible study and you feel like a fish out of water and wonder why on earth you ever said you'd come. Maybe you're looking around at the other women and are thinking about how hard it is to trust them. You've had some experiences with women that have left you determined to watch what you say because a woman's ability to be catty and cruel can cut you to the core. Or maybe you are just wary of how complicated we women can be. Relationships have been hard to navigate and you're not sure how this is all going to go. Maybe you're looking around at what other women are wearing or how smart they sound and you're feeling discouraged because of comparison. If that's how you are feeling, I want to assure you that at Walking With Purpose, we're all about creating a safe place for you to share your spiritual joys and struggles. This is a place to be real. This is a no stone zone. What do I mean by that? I'm thinking about Jesus standing with the adulterous woman, surrounded by religious leaders holding stones, ready to strike her down for her sin. Encountering Jesus made them lay their stones down and instead reflect on their own need for mercy and forgiveness. Think about how she felt when the religious leaders walked away. The way she felt in the presence of Christ is the way we want you to feel at Walking With Purpose. Relief, acceptance, safety. This is a place to come and wrestle with what you believe as together we pursue the freedom and the joy that God has for us. But creating this kind of an environment isn't easy. It requires authenticity from each one of us, and that can be scary. And it won't happen if we are letting comparison rob us of all the good that can come from a community of women who are seeking greater closeness to God together. So let's make a commitment to champion each other instead of comparing ourselves to each other. Let's let the mask drop and bring our real selves to the discussion. It's only then that we'll experience the fullness of life that God has for us. But even as I ask you for that, I recognize how hard it is to do. Although we'd probably be a lot nicer to one another if what we have struggled with and all our wounds were visible to the naked eye, few of us would ever want people to know that much about us. It feels too vulnerable to be that authentic. Out of a desire to be liked, or to protect ourselves, many of us wear masks. To begin with, we might feel surprised that no one seems to recognize that it's anything other than our true self. Then time goes on and we get so familiar with our masks that even we are unsure who we are underneath it all. What kind of masks do we hide behind? There's the mask of I'm fine. This mask gives a woman the ability to smile and say the right things even when her heart is breaking. This is the woman who wonders, where am I going? What am I doing? She's overwhelmed and feels like she's drowning and isn't sure who she can count on. This is the woman who feels like she's dying in a lonely marriage, but how can she admit that she doesn't think her husband really finds her interesting or attractive anymore? This is the woman whose ache over her infertility makes her unable to go to one more baby shower, but she figures that no one wants to hear about her sadness, so she says nothing. This is the woman who appears to have it all, but feels she's lost inside. She doesn't know who she is, what would make her happy, or why she's even here. But how do you begin to explain all that when asked, how are you doing? And really, she wonders if the person asking really wants to hear the answer. It's far safer to hide behind, I'm fine. Isn't that the answer people want to hear? 
There's also a mask of performance. This mask is clicked in place and out the door the woman goes, so, so busy. The to-do list is long, and the minute one thing is accomplished, more things are added. If you try to get to know her, you'll likely just to get to know what she does. She might be authentic about the fact that she feels pressure, but she's very unlikely to share why she keeps going at this frantic, unhealthy pace. She won't tell you that she's trying so hard to matter. She's desperate to count. She doesn't share that she's afraid that if she stops performing, she won't be worth anything at all. Another one is the mask of I don't care. This mask might appear to be authentic because there's no keeping up with the Joneses involved. This woman lets it all hang out. She doesn't bother with what she looks like. She isn't trying to say the right thing to make the other person feel good. She's got a brittle exterior that keeps people out. It seems as if she doesn't care what anyone thinks. The truth is, the hurt within her goes so deep and is so raw that she is desperate not to be seen. If only she could disappear. She is afraid of being known because if people really knew who she was, she's certain they'd reject her. For years, I didn't recognize that I had a problem with authenticity. I figured I shared pretty freely and vulnerably in the context of ministry. If I thought my story would help another woman in her brokenness, then I would share it. But then I came face to face with the fact that I had spent decades of my life hiding from some of the most important people in my life. The mask that fit most comfortably over my face was the mask of performance. I felt I was being vulnerable when I would occasionally admit that I felt pressure, but it took years before I could admit, even to myself, why I felt the pressing need to do everything perfectly and was so terrified of failure. I was so afraid that if I was real, if I shared what I truly felt, that I'd be rejected. I was afraid that if I authentically revealed what was in my heart, I wouldn't be loved. I was afraid that it wasn't safe to share, so I hid. And let me tell you, hiding, lacking authenticity, is exhausting and draining. It takes enormous energy to maintain all this stuff inside. So why do we do it? I believe that we have been duped into believing that it is easier to hide in this place of bondage, because that's what hiding is, than to get onto that painful road to freedom and healing. But when we believe this lie, we ignore just how uncomfortable and consuming it is to live with all this internal disorder. Where did all of this begin? It began in the Garden of Eden. This is where we first started to hide. Think of the vulnerability experienced by Adam and Eve before sin entered their world. We read in Genesis 2:25. The man and his wife were both naked, yet they felt no shame. But once sin entered, everything changed. Guilt over sin should cause us to say, I did something bad. But all too often, instead of guilt drawing us to confession, shame draws us to self-condemnation. And this is not what we want to parade before the neighbors, and we definitely don't want to show it to the people who we really need to love us. So we hide. And I'm going to tell you about the part that the enemy of your soul plays in this. I'm talking about Satan, and I know that a lot of you get annoyed with devil talk. So I'm sorry, but not really, because he is real. Evil isn't just something abstract. This is what the Catechism has to say about him. Behind the disobedient choice of our first parents lurks a seductive voice opposed to God. Scripture and the church's tradition see in this being a fallen angel called Satan or the devil. So here is the deal with how he works. When we sin, the Holy Spirit begins to work in our souls because that's where he is and he convicts us. This is what we feel when we know we've done something wrong and we need to make it right. By contrast, when we sin, the devil begins to work from outside of us because he is not within us, and he condemns us. He whispers shame in our ears, remember, outside in. The problem is, all too often, we don't know how to differentiate between our own voices and thoughts, God's voice, and the devil's. 
So we listen to the voice that shames us and we believe the lie that we aren't good enough, that we never will be, that we are the sin, that we're damaged beyond repair. But this is a lie and lying is Satan's language. John 8, says, he was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he speaks in character because he is a liar and the father of lies. He whispers shame and condemnation into our ears, but we have a choice how we will respond. We either choose to reject it and say no, or we agree with the lie. Satan whispers the lie that you aren't good enough, that God could never love that part of you. But the truth is found in Romans 8, 38 through 39, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any power, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Satan whispers that the sin you were struggling with is beyond the reach of God's forgiveness. But the truth is found in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Satan whispers that we'll never get away from that past sin. It's a part of us, stuck to us like tar. But the truth is found in Psalm 103, 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. We get a fresh start. When we are forgiven, we are washed clean. Satan whispers that we'll never change. We're damaged goods. But the truth is found in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. We are not who we used to be. We are no longer defined by how we've been treated or choices we've made. We are no longer defined by past sin. Do you see why it is so essential that we know scripture? This is the best way for us to be able to discern who is speaking to us. What we need to do is compare what we are hearing or thinking to what has been revealed to us in scripture. What we read in scripture is truth. If what we are hearing does not gel with what we have read in the Bible, then we know that what we are hearing is a lie. We hold the lie up to the truth, throw the lie away, and we embrace what God says. We decide to either agree with the lies or reject them. And until we come to a place where we reject the lies that have haunted us, we will never feel safe enough to be authentic. So what are some practical steps we can take towards authenticity? Step number one, be authentic with God. Authenticity is a process where we need to face the areas of our lives that have caused us to believe the lies. We all have insecurities, fears, and difficult past circumstances. If we didn't, the lies our enemy whispered wouldn't even affect us. They'd sound ridiculous. In order to be authentic, there has to be a certain comfort with our pain. There has to be an acceptance that things have happened and are happening and are going to happen. And these things make us a little broken inside. The reason that we can look at our pain honestly is because we know we have a savior. It's okay that we're broken because Christ has come to rescue us. And this makes all the difference in the world. He doesn't leave us alone. He enters into our dark places and shines his light. He meets us in our sorrow and discouragement and brings comfort. But if we wear a mask with God, we'll block his healing presence. The mask of I'm fine will keep us from asking for his help. The mask of performing will try to earn his love when it can only be received by grace. The mask of I don't care hardens the heart and keeps God out. To grow in authenticity, we need to take off the mask and ask God to accompany us as we look at the things that have caused us pain. Instead of numbing ourselves through busyness or other escapes, we need to ask God to help us see the things that have caused us to believe lies about our worth and identity. Step number two, be authentic with yourself. 
You have to know yourself to be authentic. The self-reflection that's needed in order to get to know who you really are requires getting quiet. It means that you take the time to wrestle through what you've based your identity on. If you don't do this, you'll just be who others want you to be. Who are you? You might think, I'm a student, or I'm a wife, or I'm a mother, or I'm whatever your occupation is. But none of these things are the source of your true identity. Who are you? You are God's beloved. And who you truly are will get lost if you find your worth in anything other than being God's beloved daughter. Being authentic with yourself isn't the same thing as navel-gazing. It means that you do the work of uncovering your blind spots. It means having safe people who love you speak truth into your life. Ask these people, what's it like to be around me? Take time to ask yourself, what brings me joy? Do you even know what brings you joy? I was speaking with a good friend a few weeks ago and she was so frustrated with her husband because he regularly planned recreational activities into his schedule and left her at home with the kids. He'd occasionally suggest that she go out and do this or that for herself, but what he suggested never seemed to her like it would be all that refreshing. As we talked, she realized that she was irritated with him for not knowing what would really refresh and delight her, when the real problem was that she didn't know what it was herself. She'd spent so many years just caring for her children that she couldn't articulate her own needs beyond wanting a break. She had lost touch with herself, with what brought her joy. The truth is, if she'd been able to articulate her own needs, her husband would have been happy to figure out how to give her that kind of a break. But she needed to start with some self-reflection. It wasn't fair to expect him to just figure her out. But she was just so tired. She had spent so much time taking care of everyone else, and it was taking all the energy she had just to keep it all together. When we first start to name what we need, it can be hard. When we start to dream and desire, we may worry about how it will affect those around us. In the early years when I recognized the dream for women's ministry that God had placed on my heart, I felt like I was walking on eggshells with my husband. I wondered how my dream could coexist with my desire to be a good wife and mother. It was a messy transition, but it was worth it. I didn't pursue my dreams perfectly. But this is actually one of the steps we need to take if we want to grow in authenticity. We need to be willing to grow imperfectly. No, we won't get it all right. It'll be messy. That's okay. That's why we have a Savior. Step number three, be authentic in relationships. If we want to have authentic relationships, we need to recognize that everyone has pain and difficulties and that these things cause all of us to behave in certain ways. Very often, these ways aren't pretty, perfect, or winsome. But if we want to be authentic with one another, we need to get comfortable with seeing each other's messy sides. This means that we need to develop empathy. An empathetic friend is a true balm to our hearts. I'm so inspired to be like Susie Eldridge's description of this type of a friend. And she writes, a woman of true beauty is a woman who in the depths of her soul is at rest, trusting God because she's come to know him to be worthy of her trust. She exudes a sense of calm, a sense of rest, and she invites those around her to rest as well. She speaks comfort. She knows that we live in a world at war, that we have a vicious enemy, and her journey is through a broken world. But she also knows that because of God, all is well, that all will be well. A woman of true beauty offers the grace to be and the room to become. In her presence, we can release the tension and pressure that so often grips our hearts. We can also breathe in the truth that God loves us and he is good. Jesus has modeled this beautifully for us. As we read in scripture about how he related to women, we see he continuously offered others the grace to be and the room to become. The women he valued, the ones he counted worthy, weren't perfect. There was often a messiness to the way that they were living, but he saw goodness in them and he called it out. 
Which women were valued? Who was counted worthy? It was the persistent widow of Luke 18. She went to the judge in her town and asked him to be fair, to make things right for her. She came back and back and back, and every time he ignored her. Finally, the judge gave in, but simply because she was driving him crazy with her persistence. Today, this is the woman who doesn't give up. This is the woman who keeps serving her family when the thank yous are thin or non-existent. This is the woman who stays in the marriage that feels loveless and unexciting. She's doing the work of staying, but it's hard, hard, hard. This is the friend who doesn't give up, who loves when everyone else walks away. This is the woman who sieges heaven with her prayers. She can't count how many times she's asked the Lord for her need, but this woman does not give up. That being said, in the quiet, there are times when she wonders if it matters. This is the woman God calls faithful in Luke 18. And God has always said that nothing pleases him more than faith. It's the woman in Luke 15 with the broom that cleans out her house with tenacity. She doesn't give up until she finds her missing coin. And when she finds it, she calls her neighbors to tell them all about it. This is the woman held up in scripture as the one who believed in and pursued the right things. She made the best choices. But this is the woman everyone would have said, she's just cleaning her house. It's the woman in the temple who quietly gave such a little bit No one would have been impressed with her donation. It wouldn't earn her any accolades. In fact, most would have said, why bother giving that? What difference can that little bit make? But God saw the sacrifice. God didn't see the smallness of the amount. He saw the largeness of the faith as the woman clung to him as her source of security. What the world says is small, God says is large. It's Hagar in Genesis 16 sitting by the side of the road, crying. She's been used by Abraham, used by Sarah. And now that they have their own baby, they don't need her or Ishmael anymore. She cries and wonders if her life has any worth. Does anyone care? Does anyone hear the ache of her heart? And it's to her that God sends an angel with a message for her. And it's his message for us today. And he said, I see you. That's it. I see you. I see the sacrifice. I see the hurt when what takes everything in you to give, others deem small. I see your hurt. I see your unfulfilled longings. I see you. And what are you worth to me? Oh, friends, if you ever doubt it, just look at him on the cross. He held nothing back. And all that suffering, it was for you. You are worth everything. He says, come to me. Have you felt rejected because of your size or your bank account or your background or your husband's unfaithfulness or your child's mistake or your body's inability to carry a child or your lack of achievements? Run to him. His arms are open wide. He wants you, authentic you, messy you. He loves you just as you are. Will you pray with me, please? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear Lord, in that deep heart within us, the parts that we keep hidden from so many others, you see us and you value what you see there. When you see our mess, you do not turn away. You press in with your deep desire to heal. When you see our weariness, you don't look at us telling us to get back up and work a little bit harder. You cradle us in your arms and invite us to rest. When we feel we've expended so much energy just trying to keep up, just trying to put forward the right impression, you say, oh, let it all drop. Let it all just drop to the floor because I just want you authentic you, messy you, the real you. Thank you for this kind of unconditional, relentless love. May we spend our time throughout keeping in balance, opening our hearts more and more to receive that love. 
because if we can, we will be deeply changed at the heart level. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.